Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, a show where we talk to experts who've taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have sailed around the world to those who've started thriving businesses and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. This is episode 47 with activist and adventurer, Rob Greenfield. This episode was brought to you by New Zest, a company from New Zealand I discovered there that makes some of the healthiest, yummiest, and sustainable vitamin and quality pea protein supplement powders and bars on the market. There's no GMO, no dairy, no soy, gluten, grains, artificial sweeteners, no added sugar, no preservatives, no fillers, no animal products, no bad stuff. It's all good stuff made in Belgium, Australia, or New Zealand, not in China. I'm a huge advocate for clean, healthy eating, and I also travel a lot, which is why I love taking New Zest powders and bars on the road. My favorites are their chocolate clean lean protein, the just fruit and veg mix, which actually has five fruits and five veggies inside, and a product called the Quick Vita Kick, which has all the vitamins you need to go all day long, plus protein, prebiotics, probiotics, real fruits and veggies, and digestive enzymes with only 48 calories, zero grams of sugar, and six grams of protein. The Cacao Honey Quick Vita Kick is my favorite. I kind of use it like dessert. All of their powders taste great. Right now, if you use the code WILDIDEAS at newzest.com, hyphen usa.com that's n-u-z-e-s-t hyphen usa.com you'll get 15 percent off every order even repeat orders so go to newzest hyphen usa.com make sure you enter the code wild ideas at checkout this episode was brought to you by olakai a company who puts a ton of time and thought into crafting amazing footwear for men and women I have a ton of pairs of Olakai sandals and even some of their slip-ons, and I love their shoes because they're all made really well so they don't break down, and they're all stylish so you can wear them with really nice outfits and always to the beach. Olakai was founded to celebrate the Aloha spirit and the waterman lifestyle, and they also aim to do a lot of good. They believe that sustainability and positive living is less about an ethos and more about the choices and actions you make every day. One of the best parts is this company is a certified B Corporation, and they do a ton of giving back to communities. They even have their own Ama Olukai Foundation, a nonprofit that helps to preserve the Hawaiian culture and the Hawaiian spirit, which I'm a big fan of, considering my grandma lived in the islands. You can check them out and buy an awesome pair of sandals or even some slip-ons or one of their new pairs of boots for yourself or a loved one this season at olukai.com. That's O-L-U-K-A-I, olukai.com. Rob Greenfield is an adventurer, environmental activist, humanitarian, and dude making a difference. He's had a ton of wild ideas from cycling across the USA three times on a bamboo bike to raise awareness about sustainability, diving into more than 2,000 dumpsters across the US to talk about food waste, traveling to really far countries without any money to show that people are inherently good, living in a tiny house, spending a month living like the average American but wearing all the trash he created and doing it in the middle of New York City, and owning only the possessions that fit into his backpack. He's written a book, given tons of TED Talks, and so much more. He's a fascinating guy, and this is one of my favorite shows ever. I hope you enjoy it. All right, so today we have on Rob Greenfield. Rob, welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living. Thank you for having me. It's nice to finally meet after four years. I know. So how how do we know each other? Well... I randomly reached out to you in 2013 asking you to write a story about my bike ride across the country because I saw you were a journalist. I remember this and I think I wrote it for Grind TV and someone wrote in, you're riding your bike across the country and someone wrote the dumbest comment. It was so mean. It was like, (laughs) this kid's just selfish. He's just doing it for himself. I don't remember that. I've blocked those all out. Well, good for you. Um, We'll talk about haters a little later (laughs) because 
What you do is awesome. If anybody's had a wild idea, Rob, you've had so many. I want to talk about your first wild idea, which was riding this beautiful bamboo bike that's actually sitting outside our house right now. It's so cool. But you biked across the USA with the goal to leave no impact on the way. So maybe just really briefly tell us where you're at in life, how old you were, how you got this wild idea and kind of it sounded like you were on track to make a million dollars before you were 30 and to get a bunch of hot chicks. Like, <laughs> talk to me about this. Okay. So this would be take us back to 2013, so four years ago. And I had just started my journey towards trying to live a more environmentally friendly and ethically res- you know, responsible life. Um, two years prior to that, so 2011, I was 25 years old. I was very materialistic. My goal was to be a millionaire by the time I was 30. Um, and I spent every Sunday shining my car for about two hours, you know, chased every girl that passed by. And this was my passion in life. Those, those were really my passions chasing the American dream. And then what happened is I moved out to San Diego and I just started to watch a lot of documentaries, read a lot of books and realize that my life wasn't what I thought it was. My life was causing destruction to everything that I loved through all of my daily actions the food I was eating, the water I was using, the car that I was driving, the, the fossil fuels, uh, every one of my daily actions was causing destruction. So I decided to change my life around. After two years of changing my life around, that's when I decided to become an activist and embark on the bike ride across the country. So what did you learn on this first adventure? Well, so the idea of it was to, as you said, live as low of an impact lifestyle as I possibly could, which meant stripping my life back to the absolute basics and with everything down to food, water, energy, waste, and transportation, the idea was to try to understand almost every action that I take and how it affects the world. And so by doing that for 104 days, it basically ingrained the habits and the philosophies of living a more simple, environmentally friendly life. That's awesome. But how did you build this bamboo bike really quickly? And and there's, I remember you took a picture like butt naked at one place. (laughs) Yeah. Of course, I just remember that part. You wrote, I remember you wrote that in the story about biking across part of Nevada naked. Um, So I picked up that I didn't actually build the bike. I picked it up two days before the bike ride from San Francisco. And uh, then I was set on out across the country trying to, you know, have no impact and never had really done that much biking before. I was definitely a, a novice to cycling. And uh, it was a pretty new adventure to me when I began. I was definitely in over my head. And now you've done it two more times. Yep. Two more times. And then this third time, uh, was a community bike ride that anybody could join. And there was 30 people that started in Central Park together, including my girlfriend who said she would never, ever bike across the country, and she did it. I'm going to ask you more about your girlfriend later. So w- the next trip, was it was the next wild idea traveling with zero money to Brazil or something like that? Yeah, so after getting back from San Diego, you know, over time I was learning more and more that I didn't need money to be happy in life and to be purposeful and passionate. And that ultimately I found that the happiest people I've met through all of my travels are people that don't have tons and tons of money. It's often people who have less money who are much happier. And so I started to see that and I just started to see that when I based my life around other things besides money, when I based it around relationships, love, experiences, uh, you know, connection with the earth. That's what made me feel my best and where I was able to be able to give back. So I set out to try to learn to live with no money. And I found that one of the best ways I could do that was to basically maroon myself in a far off country with no money. By doing that, I was forced to try to exist without money. So you you went to the airport with a dime or like, like how did this happen? Uh, so the first time I did it, I left my apartment in San Diego. I had already bought a flight to Cabo, Mexico. I left with just the clothes in my back, my passport, and my cell phone at the time on airplane mode. So I couldn't use it and no money. And I landed in Cabo um, and I didn't know where I was going, had not set anything up. I walked out of the airport. It was a 10 mile walk in the town and I just stuck my hands up in the air and started walking. And then what happened? 
Uh, then I slept on the beach and had a very freezing cold night. Um, I found a wet towel to use as a blanket. The first night was very, very rough. And then the second day I found a computer and went on to couch surfing and then made some friends through couch surfing, spent a little time there. Eventually, after I got my guts up, I hit the road, you know, stuck my, I, I had earned $15 doing headstands on the street. And then I gave 10 of that away, bought a bus ticket for like three. And when I got to the desert, I had zero dollars and then I had a thousand miles to cross. So what happened <laughs> next? Whoa, actually, that's right. I bought a bag of lentils and a bag of rice and I cooked all of them and put them in a pillowcase. So that's what I had with me. And then after I got rides, um, I, people were really nice. They picked me up and the problem was they were a lot of really short rides. After 24 hours, the lentils and rice went sour. So I had to dump those out. So I had no money. I was in the middle. I mean, the ba Baja is, you know, some pretty remote area. And um, after a while, some guy picked me up and was going all the way to the border. And so I was in his car for 17 hours. It was the back of a fish truck that was leaking ice water onto my legs and it was 50 degrees at night. I came, like when we got to the border, I just like almost stumbled to my knees just being from being so cold. So your first adventure wasn't the most fun, but then you've done other adventures without money, correct? Yeah, so then um, I did, I went to Panama. So I did the same thing. This time I flew to Panama, except without my cell phone. It was literally... The clothes in my back, so I had sandals, shorts, a shirt, a jacket, a hat, and my passport. Six total items, no underwear, no toothbrush, no money, no credit card, none of that. Landed in Panama and then had to travel 4,000 miles through Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, Mexico, Guatemala. Okay, back. so what are some of the things you did to to travel to these places without money? Like, give me some examples and maybe one or two stories. Well, the first day when I got to, well, I guess it was about the third day I needed, I found that ultimately to have zero money was very hard. So one of the first things I did is I collected cans, 500 cans amounted to $5. It was definitely the hardest $5 that I ever earned. It took like 12 or 14 hours to earn five bucks down there. Um, but ultimately, you know, the idea was by doing this was the mainstream media portrays the world often as this dangerous, violent place. People are afraid to go to Mexico because they think it's this violent place. And the saying, if it bleeds, it leads, is the common narrative in mainstream media. So ultimately, what I wanted to do was by putting myself out there with nothing, I was dependent upon the kindness of humanity. And by being dependent on others, the idea was to see, will people be good to me? Will people help me? And ultimately, that's what got me through all of it. Resourcefulness was a part of it to test resourcefulness. But ultimately, that trip was about seeing if people are good. And when I got back from that trip, 4,000 miles of traveling, that literally the only words that could come, to my, come out of my mouth were just, people are good. I just screamed it like, people are good, over and over. <laughs> If you were here right now, you would see Rob raising his hands in the air and there's like embracing motion saying people are good, which is so cool. So there's two things I have to ask you. One, resourcefulness. You were an Eagle Scout. So if someone is going to live this kind of lifestyle that you did, which is relying on others, which I don't know, I kind of cringe when it's like I have to rely on others. I don't ever want to have to rely on others. So the resourcefulness part of it, what, what kind of skills do you need to do something like this? Well, there's actually a really important, almost a slightly more important part than the resourcefulness, and that is the inability to rely on others, mm. because that's how I've always felt. Felt As an Eagle Scout, you're prepared for everything. Um, as a, an American, generally the idea is don't depend on anyone else for anything, be independent, earn everything. But ultimately, I think that is one of our biggest flaws, is that we there's 7 billion of us on this earth. We don't have another earth. We have to work together. Um, the idea that money can make us independent is a total illusion. Someone is doing that for you. You're just erasing the humanity of it by making it a monetary transaction instead. And so ultimately, like 
People like you and I are often good at giving, but to receive is a skill that we don't have. And so in order to learn to receive, I had to force myself to do it. And, and ultimately by learning to receive, it helped me to put myself in the shoes of others so that I could be better at giving and being compassionate because I needed that compassion in that time. Mm, that's, I want to talk more about that, but still Eagle Scout, like what are the skills yeah. that you had? So as far as resourcefulness, that's something that, well, I mean, as an Eagle Scout, you learn everything from orienteering to fire making to knot tying to sailing and emergency preparedness and first aid, shelter building. In my Boy Scout troop, we camped 12 months of the year every year. So I went camping, you know, whether it was the coldest it ever was, was negative 30 and we built igloos and camped on those. Uh, and you know, in the summer it was obviously a lot easier. And this is in Wisconsin. Yeah. Wow. So interesting. So I'm going to skip ahead really quickly and then go backwards. So there's a couple of other wild ideas I want you to talk about on this show. One is dumpster diving. Why dive in dumpsters? And maybe you can tell me some stats about food waste and then some things you find in dumpsters. Sure. Uh, that ultimately is the resourcefulness that you were just asking about. That is one of the things that allows me to have adventures that cost almost nothing. So when I first started dumpster diving, it was April of 2013, uh, about the time that I had reached out to you. And I was embarrassed at the concept of diving into a dumpster, you know, eating garbage. You know, I had a big ego at the time. It wasn't something that I really wanted to tell people, but I was doing this bike ride trying to have the least impact possible. So what better way to have no impact than to find stuff that's going to waste? So I started to open up grocery store dumpsters and just started to find that dumpster after dumpster after dumpsters filled to the brim. And I'm talking filled to the brim with perfectly good food and perfectly good food, perfectly good food. So for example, you know, you have a five pound bag of oranges, one Orange is bad, so they throw away the whole thing. Even cra like crazy things like a 24-pack of bottled water, one bottle springs leak, so they throw away the whole 24-pack. Um, things are thrown away often a month or more before the suggested sell-by date. So things like boxes of Kashi granola bars or cereals or kind bars, chocolate, uh, you know, then organic fruits and vegetables. You know, the uh, last week we got maca powder out of the dumpster. So you can find health food or if you're in the mood for a dozen tr donuts, you know, things like that or pizza, you can find in this country anything you want in the dumpsters, basically. Wow. So are dumpsters generally open? Because the one closest to my house is like you can tell there's like a security guard next to it. It's yes. a really high-end grocery store. Yeah. So I've been in a, over 2,000 dumpsters across the United States in 30 states. Um, and I've found generally about half dumpsters are access, accessible and half not maybe. Maybe 60-40 or something like that. So it's really a numbers game. And if you're on an adventure, whether you're biking across the country or you're on a rock climbing trip and you're passing through towns, it's really just if you stop in enough dumpsters, you're going to find more food than you could eat and share with all of your friends. And you're going to, you're going into the run into the problem of having way too much food. And I know you've talked about this. Like, do you have any stats you can share with the audience about food waste? Sure. So we waste $165 billion worth of food per year. That's billion with a B. And to give you an uh, idea of how much that is, that's more than the budgets for America's national parks, public libraries, federal prisons, uh, veterans health care, the FBI, and the FDA combined. So it's a massive number. We waste 40% or more of all of our food, so about half of all our food, which means we produce enough food to feed two entire American populations. So take all 50 states, double that, and that's how much food we're producing while about one in seven million or one in seven Americans, which is about 50 million Americans are food insecure. Food insecure meaning? So food insecure basically means that people don't know where their next meal is going to come from. And it doesn't mean every day, you know, some days maybe they've got their three meals, but it means that sometimes those people don't know where their next meal is coming from. One in seven? One in seven. And it's actually like people think, you know, when they think of 
of hunger, they think often of like homeless people. But in reality, hunger is much more elders, children, single mothers. The face of homelessness can't be stereotyped. It's a huge number of people and it's a huge range of people. I mean, one in seven Americans means you're walking past people that are struggling for food probably every single day. And you just don't know it because that's the society that we live in where all of these things are behind the scenes and they're out of sight, out of mind. So how, so, so in dive, you've actually started to raise awareness about food waste through this dumpster diving and you do kind of group dumpster dives. And <laughs> so first off, how did you get over in your insecurity to dive in dumpsters and tell me about what your girlfriend thought of all of this? Sure. Well, I got over it because what I found is the best way to get myself over things is by f- having to force myself to do it. So the reason I got past it is because on the bike ride, I had to bike across the country having no impact. So I made that adventure. I put it out there. People know, knew I was doing it. So then I had to do it. So that's how I get myself to get like to get outside of my comfort zone. I come up with a plan. I announce it. And then I've got to do it. And then, and I'm an honest person, so then I have to actually do it. So that's kind of been my strategy of getting past things and getting outside of my comfort zone. And and then as far as my girlfriend now, at the time when I started dumpster diving, she wasn't my girlfriend. She disapproved of it. Her mom disapproved of it. She told me on the phone not to tell anyone that I was dumpster diving. Fast forward, we are now together. Um, she doesn't dumpster dive or she doesn't get in the dumpster with me but she'll stand there and I pass the food out to her and (laughs) so I always say it's proof that you can eat the trash and have the girl too you can eat the trash and have the girl too have you ever gotten into trouble doing this so I've been I've had the cops the police come twice out of 2,000 dumpsters so pretty low ratio Um, one time the police in Iowa um, made we made friends they added me to Facebook about half hour later uh, a week later, I was on the news in Wisconsin and the news had pulled a picture that I put of me and the police on my Facebook page and put it on the news. And then I saw the police Facebook page saying, hey, our friend Rob got us on the news in Wisconsin. So uh, and the other time the police came and weirdly enough, somebody came out of the store and walked up to the police officer and said, hey, I told him he could be in there even though he hadn't, uh, he just kind of saved me. Um, so I haven't been in trouble. However, because I am a, a white, you know, male in the United States, I was just going to ask you that. I was like, but you're a white male with like this huge smile. You're young. Yeah. So I have, you know, privileges that make all of this easier. All of my adventures traveling through South America with no money, dumpster diving, all of these things are easier because I have these you know, privileges that I'm born with. Um, So if you're homeless, dumpster diving is a different story because the police are more more likely to hassle you. I went dumpster diving with some black guys down in um, Southside Chicago and they were scared of getting shot being back there in the dumpster in the night. So to help with that, I started the Dumpster Divers Defense Fund, which if you ever get ticketed or arrested for dumpster diving, it'll pay all of your costs, get you out of jail and bring media attention to it. So... Wow, Rob, that's so cool. So one of the things you do, I, I keep thinking back to that story that I first wrote of you and some whatever kid wrote like, oh, this guy's just super selfish and biking across America, whatever, selfish or not, you do a lot of giving. Can you talk about a little bit of the giving you do through, besides raising awareness? Sure. Um, so I would say in the past, I was a much more selfish person. So maybe that guy who commented had more accuracy than he does today. Still, he was fairly inaccurate. Um, I it, mean, was, the b- it was the age of media <laughs> trolls, whatever. Yeah. So now, um, so 100% of my media income is donated directly to nonprofits. So the TV show that I did with, with Discovery Channel, my book, it's written into all those contracts that I don't see a penny of it that it's donated directly to nonprofits. Most of my public speaking goes to nonprofits. This year, uh, my commitment was to make only $5,000, which I did. So no more making money for the year. 100% goes into nonprofit work. Um, How did you make money this year? uh, So public speaking is how I do make money. Okay. Um, In the past, I ran a marketing company up until about 2014. So that's how I made money. 
Um, and then I had some savings when I started these adventures. So about 2014, I, when I got like at the end of it, I gave the last that I had and kept $15,000 that lasted two years. And then this year, my income was 5,000. And so the idea is, you know, I could save and save and save and use it when I'm 60, 70, if I live to be 60 or 70. But the way I look at it is that I think we're in dire times on earth right now. I think that would be somewhat hard to argue with all of what we're dealing with today. So I'm 31. I could be storing away this money for the future, if there is a future, which I think there is a future, or I could be putting that money into nonprofits that will be changing our future for the better, that will be ensuring that we have more clean water and clean air and helping people in the problems they are in now. So that's really what it comes down to me is that I think we're in dire times and I feel that I must give as much as I possibly can today, not in 30 years. Good for you. It's so interesting. So one of the other things you recently did was you lived like an average American and walked around with all the trash you created in New York City on you. So like imagine Rob wearing these giant <laughs> bags of trash on his, on his chest, on his sides, on his back. How many pounds of trash were you carrying around? It was 87 pounds how at the you, end of it. How did you walk? I had a specially designed trash suit uh, to be able to distribute the weight properly. It had a backpack frame in it. Uh, and I just kind of waddled around New York City. And how do you, I mean, I'm sh what, maybe tell us like one reaction you got from it. And to how, I mean, I like to think that I don't care what other people think, but I totally do. I'm just completely guilty of caring what other people think. Yep. So one, give us a little piece of what kind of feedback you got and two how do you not give an a hoot yep. at what other people think of you yeah so you and i understand why i was doing it but just to make sure people know the reason was i was creating a visual of how much garbage the average american creates so i was just living like the average american to authentically create the garbage that the average american does and that was the idea to create a visual that helps people understand how much garbage they create and how much it adds up because it's out of sight out of mind when we put it in the garbage can so how i was able to well first how, you know, some of the reactions. One of the early relieving reactions was in New York City, people have seen everything. That's the idea. So are people going to pay attention to a guy walking around covered in trash? That was the question. About day three, I was in a store and this woman walks up to me and she says, I know I'm a New Yorker and I'm supposed to have seen everything, but I have never seen this before. What are you doing? And that was the conversation starter always to get to talk to people about this issue but I didn't have to bring it up and I wasn't telling anyone what to do. I was just living a normal life except covered in trash. Um, other things, for example, there was a woman that walked up to me and she said, hey, I just saw you in the newspaper yesterday. I want you to know that I already started using a reusable coffee mug, which I'd never done before. And I just started recycling for the first time. So here's a woman who is in her 40s, 50s and never even had recycled. And this was you know, this was a shocking image, a wake up call to her. So that was the idea. These shocking, kind of to shock people. And you're able to get media wherever you go. And, and did you study marketing? Um, I didn't study marketing, but I did start a marketing company when I was 23 or 24 ish. So I did advertising and social media management. But basically what it comes down to is I was a salesman. I sold educational books door to door when I was in university for 80 to 90 hours a week. I worked 80 to 90 hours a week every summer between university. Um, and so I just learned to handle rejection, which brings us back to the question of how did I not worry what people were thinking about me? What it was is I still worry sometimes, but well, for one, I feel that what I'm doing is more important than what people think about me. And that helps me a lot. But in this, because I, I do, what I do is I practice not worrying what people think about me. For example, one of my early practices was for one week, I could only eat with my hands, no matter where I was, even if it was at a party or something like that, which is weird to most people. 
But by doing that, that was one way where it took me out of my comfort zone, where I knew people were wondering what I was doing. And it was an exercise that brought me out my, outside of my comfort zone and got me used to being different in public and not worrying. And only by you know doing that was I able to get past it. So these sorts of projects like dumpster diving is the same thing. But once I, at first it was rough, but once I started to do it and started to talk about it, then people said, okay, this guy's got a point. That's when it was able to work. And then as far as Trash Me goes, what happened was I watched The Big Short. Have you seen that movie? Yeah, yeah. Like day two or day three of the project, I, I was nervous about walking around covered in trash in New York City. And I watched The Big Short and it reminded me of how 2008, 2009, a million people lost their houses in the housing, housing market crash. And I realized how delusional of lives so many of us live. We think, you know, we're protected and, and that, you know, we can just save the, up our money and we can have our mortgage and we can build this life that is immune to problems and where, you know, this sort of American dream. And a million people lost their house that, and a lot of them became homeless, people that never thought that was possible. And so I've just realized how delusional we are to so many things. And that was a reminder. And when I thought about that, I was like, okay, well, we're all just a bunch of delusional human beings walking around. Why does it matter what anybody thinks? Because we're all pretty much delusional anyway. Good point. <laughs> how can I live with less? Like we were just talking and I said, you know, I eat a mostly plant-based diet, but you don't know about my vegetables. Like my spinach comes in this giant plastic bin. I go to Trader Joe's and I think I'm being so smart because it's really inexpensive and I can get tons of veggies, but they're all wrapped in plastic. So I try to go to the farmer's market. And even then like the tomato guy has to put his tomatoes in plastic bags. Like, like what can we do if we're not going to be completely extreme like you, yeah. to start living with less, especially when it comes to food. Yeah, and that is the whole idea. I do extreme things to draw attention, but the message isn't for anyone listening to this to go out and cover themselves in trash, dive into every dumpster they see, uh, you know, travel with no money. Sure, do those things if you want to, but the message is all about what can we do as individuals where we are, at home, at work, at school, to have a more positive impact. So people do get caught up like, I can't do that. But again, that's not the point. We can all do so much wherever we live. So as far as, you know, trying to create less trash when it comes to food, because that's where so much of the trash was, shopping in bulk is a really big one. So you have co-ops like here in San Diego, there's the Ocean Beach People's Co-op, but around the country, there's thousands of co-ops and there's all sorts of grocery stores that have uh, bulk food sections where you can get all your grains, nuts, you know, seeds, flour, uh, you know, hundreds of different items, even things like chocolate and candies can come unpackaged. So that's one thing, uh, carrying your own reusable bag, carrying your own reusable bottle. Uh, and then a big part of it is reprioritizing our lives. Ultimately, everyone listening to this podcast probably has the ability to reprioritize their life because we are a group of people who probably have a lot more freedom than many people. Uh, so it comes down to, is it worth it? Putting, like, for example, if it is more expensive to shop at the farmer's market, but probably we're putting money into something else somewhere somewhere that maybe isn't even good for us. Maybe it's $100 a month in liquor, for example, or kombucha beer. Kombucha <laughs> and coffee. So make your own kombucha. That's a huge one. Terrible it, for you. It costs a quarter. Oh, you don't like kombucha? No, anyway. it's good. I oh. like it. I just don't. It's, I really believe that the kind you buy at the store is basically glorified mm. soda water with a healthy label on it. Oh man, I do love my kombucha. That's actually one of my f like few crutches in life. It's terrible. But okay, so so you can. You're right. I want to keep going into this, but I want to dive deeper. You live with just less overall. You said you have 111 possessions to your name. You you basically live out of a backpack. And if you look at Rob, like he's a good looking guy. He looks like you and I. He's an adventurer. You know, I think a lot of people on this podcast might just think you're a trust fund kid yeah. and you have a big cushion to fall back on. Is that true? Can we just dispel this mess? Yeah, that's a, that's, you talk about internet trolls. That's a big one. Like trust fund hippie kid. So I grew up, my mom had me and three siblings and no dads. And we had three different dads. 
And she made $15,000 a year to support the four of us. We lived in a two bedroom house. My mom had a bunk bed with my sister until she was like 12. The three of us boys shared a room. Um, and so we, uh, you know, we were pretty low income. Um, you know, I didn't start with a single in high school. I had saved up to about $2,000. Like I got a paper route when I was in sixth grade, uh, worked out, Hardy's in ninth grade, you know, so I've always worked hard, no trust fund, uh, ever, you know, but you can live with less. And I think all of us want to do that because it seems like you're really free. You're really happy. You have this glow about you. Like how can I just live with less money, less possessions and not have to be so worried about my sponsors supporting this podcast and (laughs) making money? Well, so minimalism is a hot thing right now. And it's not just about possessions. It's an entire mindset. And the thing is, like, people think of what you're going without. But what I've found is that the more that I've given up, the more that I've received. Because when I give up stuff and when I give up bills, I gain in purpose in in the ability to do what I want to do when I wake up in the morning. Because if I don't have a hundred dollar cell phone bill, which is twelve hundred dollars a year, that means twelve hundred dollars worth of work that I don't have to do, which means I can be doing what I love to do. And so it's like these things about where I in the past I thought were giving up, I've just received so much in freedom and purpose and passion and health by living this simpler life. How do you contact people? Like we communicated all day and yet you don't have a cell phone. So I use uh, Wi-Fi wherever I am and I use Google Voice. So it's a free um, number. It works just like uh, you, no one knows it's not a cell phone in the sense that it appears as a, the same number. You can get but you text. Have a phone. I don't have a phone. I just use a computer and I also have an iPod touch. Those are my two technological type things. That's amazing. So an iPod, but do you have Instagram? I have Instagram, which is yeah, the iPod touch, which is, works for that. So I just, I just communicate when I'm on Wi-Fi, which ultimately, you know, people worry about the idea of not having a cell phone and being, you know, too disconnected. But our problem is being overconnected, never having that moment to relax. And so I found that in the busy world that we live in today, I've had to do things that force myself to do what I want to do. So by not having a cell phone, it forces me that when I go outside, I'm present where I am. And presence is something that's worth way more than any money that I could ever earn. To be to be able to exist in a way that for so many of us can't even fathom anymore. Even though 20 years ago, everybody existed that way. But I mean, less than that. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy how quickly this whole thing has changed. I hope my mother and all my friends addicted to their cell phones are listening to this podcast. This is so awesome that you don't have a cell phone and you don't have a lot of things. Yeah. And so, you know, talk about exercises. Here's an exercise. One day, take your cell phone, turn it off, put it in your uh, sock drawer or whatever, and go out for the day. That's a practice. I I had I had been completely cell phone dependent until Thanksgiving Day 2013, I think. I couldn't even fathom the idea of leaving the house without my cell phone. And I just was like, I'm going to do it for 24 hours. Left it at home. I felt so naked going outside without it. I was like, hey, friends, just so you know, like I'm going out and you won't be able to reach me. And it was a, it was a day never to forget that it was a feeling I hadn't felt in years. So wild ideas challenge. Go with yourself out a cell phone for one day. Um, all right, we're gonna get to the quick and dirty. This is I'm so stoked you came on this show, Rob. You've given a, a TED talk. Any tips on how to give a good presentation? Two actually. Um, the first one was well. So how to give a good presentation? Have something worth talking about. Like that's the main thing. Practice a lot. If you are ever doing a TEDx talk, practice. Like how um, many times? I'm talking to all the Girl Scouts tomorrow. Um, well, probably... 24 hours. <laughs> probably <laughs> you want to practice months in advance, ideally, and practice dozens and dozens of times. The more you know your stuff, the easier it is, though. So talk about what you're really passionate about, what you love. That helps a lot. Like the, the more that 
Well, I'm rambling on. Let's go to the next go, one. No, what's the second tip? <laughs> know your story and then... And then do what you're passionate about. The, like people burn out when they're talking about stuff they don't really want to be talking about. Okay. So the more authentic you can be, and I don't mean trying to be authentic, just be yourself. That's how you're going to deliver the best talk. Love it. What about writing a book? You wrote a book and somehow got like Ben and Jerry to endorse <laughs> it. I remember these things. Well, Jerry has the same last name as me, Jerry Greenfield. So I called him up and was like, hey, I'd like to talk to Jerry Greenfield. We got the same last name. And I was got a hold of his secretary. And she was like, well, let me ask. And he called me back three days later. And he was like, hey, Cousin Rob. We're not cousins, but he was just happy to talk to another Greenfield. That was one of the few times my last name has ever been awesome. Now I like it, but in the past I didn't. Anyway, how to write a book. Again, do something worth writing about. That's where the big start is, really do something worth writing about. Love that. And then how did you get a publisher for that? I had been contacted by a publisher to ask if I was interested in writing a book about food waste. And I said, I would love to, but I just don't have time to right now. And then like on the closing email, I was like, wait a sec, I'm writing a book right now that I was planning on self-publishing. Are you interested in looking at it? And they said yes. And then a week later, they got back to me and said, we'd like to publish it. Heck yeah. How about advice on having a goal and achieving it? You've had a lot of like game goals, but you go after them and you get them. I would say with your big goals, have small goals that help you build up to it. So if you have a really big goal, but you don't have any steps towards it, it makes it much more challenging. So find small goals that can build up to help you get to that point. For example, I'm, one of my goals was to sell my car. But in order to do that, first I had to learn that I could bike far enough distances to not have a car. So first I was able to bike five miles, then 10 miles, then 25 miles before I was ever able to really deeply fathom the idea of selling the car. You're in really good shape. I think I'm going to go get a bike this weekend. <laughs> I'm just so scared of getting hit by a car. Uh, it's, uh, it is a little sucky sometimes riding on the road, I must admit. Best find in a dumpster. Well, one time on my birthday, August 28th, uh, 2014, I went out for a cake and I found two dumpster cakes. <laughs> so it's great when you know what you want and you find it, especially also as a cyclist, when you want peanut butter, especially like organic Maranatha peanut butter, that's the best as a cyclist. You're hilarious. What's the weirdest or funniest interaction you've had with another human doing what you do? Uh, well, actually, <laughs> this was a really weird interaction was that same dumpster cake that I'm talking about, how it was, how it came out to me. I was at the dumpster with a news crew doing a story about dumpster dive, about food waste. And a lady comes out the back door with a cart full of cakes to throw in the dumpster. And I say, it's my birthday and I'm looking for a dumpster cake. And I'm like, can I have one? Because she was about to throw them in the dumpster and she looks at it, punches the cake, and then hands it to me. <laughs> That's awesome. Best place you've traveled to? Kenya and Indonesia were two of my favorite. The um, uh, Komodo Islands in, in Indonesia, just it's like visiting a land before time when dinosaurs still exist and existed. And Kenya is just the most colorful place that I've ever been. Just stole my heart. Oh, and the people are so mm -hmm. awesome there. Coconuts or avocado? Um, both. <laughs> you have to choose one. Which is more sustaining? I guess coconut. Okay. Vegan or paleo? I would, if I was personally choosing one, I would go with vegan or paleo. <laughs> yeah. What do you, how do you eat? Let's just tell people. Well, I eat a nine, about a 90% plant-based diet, but like if I'm going to eat meat, I want to catch that fish and eat it. So it's kind of a, you know, I have a, I, there's parts of both obviously that I agree with. It's more of a, a blend of the two. I love that. Best books you've read in your life. Let's see. Well, one of the ones that instantly comes to mind that was the most impactful was Yvonne Schwinard's The Responsible Company and Let My People Go Surf, or Let My People Surf. Those were two, two very impactful ones early on for me. And you're just head to toe Patagonia. So I was like, are you sponsored by Patagonia? 
Uh, well, they've done some sponsoring on my, so a couple of my adventures, but uh, since I almost never need new clothes, that kind of disappeared since I haven't gotten any new clothes in like three years. Rob's Patagonia shirt has about 10 or 15 stitches on the back and it's it's well worn. It, it looks awesome. Yeah. Gear you always have with you that you love and you really don't want to live without. A bicycle is a pretty important part in living a simple life that revolves around minimal money. Uh, a pot with a top on it so it can be used for cooking as well as for carrying food and getting, you could put your left leftovers in it as well. Um, and then a water purifier. So wherever you are, you can always drink water. Best gift you've ever been given? Hmm. Well, after 31, well, no, it started more recently asking people not to give me gifts. This year, nobody gave me any gifts except one guy gave me a zucchini. And the best gift, I mean, I mean, this is, there's probably better gifts, but having a birthday with no gifts was pretty nice. That is really nice because then you don't have to return them. <laughs> yep. That's not to say I don't like gifts, but I, I love the whole minimal thing. What's the best gift you've given someone else? I guess uh, probably a gift of more freedom, you know, teaching people that they don't need what they thought they not needed and helping them to attain the freedom that allows them to live the life that they want. Advice you'd give to your 15-year-old self, and maybe you can briefly say what you were like at 15. So at 15, I was really worried about what everybody thought about me. So I'd have been a freshman in high school or so. I was spending most of my money on clothes. I would ride my bike at that time to the clothes store. And that's where I you know, would spend a lot of my money. Um, pretty much everything that I did largely revolved around what other people would think about me, social stigmas. And so I would say, stop worrying what people think about you and instead do what you feel is right for yourself, for the earth and your community. If you could throw a party right now, what kind of party are you throwing? Where is it? Who's coming? Um, I like pretty chill parties. So it would be definitely one that had, you know, no waste. It wouldn't create any garbage and it would involve very little money. Probably a potluck on the beach, maybe. I love it. I'm, we're totally into potlucks. We had like a little potluck club in New Zealand. It was so fun. If you could fly an eco-friendly plane or drone around the world and, and it could have one message, what would it say? Mm. Dang, that's a tough one. So I sent that to you, you ahead of time. Me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I sent Rob a list of questions and he's like, nope, I got to be, I got to be spontaneous. And so he didn't look at him, which is awesome because you are getting the real thing right here. Yeah. I don't like ever to have questions sent to me in advance. If it could have one message, um, how about be good to the earth, be good to everyone, be good to all the animals, live an examined life where you know your actions and how it affects the world. It's a long banner, but I love it. Last question. What does Cheryl think of all of this? Oh, yeah. We forgot about that part. So Cheryl's been the most incredible partner in journeying towards a more simple, sustainable life. She inspired me in the first place for so much. She inspired me to think about the cosmetics that I was putting onto my body and the food that I was putting in my body. She's an acupuncturist and massage therapist. She taught me about traditional Chinese medicine and natural medicine. Um, and so, and then I've taught her a lot and She's been on this path where it took her longer, but now she doesn't have a car. Now does she, now she doesn't have any bills or a cell phone or anything like that. So we're in the you know we're in the same mindset. She doesn't you know do things nearly as extreme as I do, but she's doing a lot of it, and she's uh, really really happy. And we're really really happy to be together. She seems really sweet, and you seem really happy. This might be too personal, but what do you guys do about health insurance? Yeah, there's no question that's too personal for me, okay. period, because I live an open book, transparent life. So Cheryl has had health insurance, and I assume she still does. I personally don't have health insurance. Because I earn no money, I would qualify for free health care, but that would be far too much ammunition for a right-wing Republicans to think I'm mooching off of the system. So I don't accept the healthcare and I just don't have healthcare. My main thing is preventative healthcare. So over 75% of all major problems are 
come down to diet, exercise, and stress. So by living a life where I treat those things far in advance, that's the big part. And then as far as emergencies go, you know, it's possible that I'll never have an emergency and it'll be just fine. As an Eagle Scout, I've sewed myself up multiple times when I've had big cuts. I now carry uh, medical sutures so I can sew myself up. Um, you know, if you lose a finger, that's something that you can deal with as an individual. If you have lost a whole leg, you know, that's a different story. So basically, the time will come to see if anything like that happens. And ultimately, you know, one of the big things is this is one of those things I never expected. But as you become more minimalist in your mindset and in your possessions, now that I have no bills, no debt, no credit card, no bank account, and all the possessions I own fit with me, if I died leaving here tonight, nobody has to deal with any of my crap or any of my stuff. I feel a sense of uh, presence that I never would have been able to imagine in the past. And so many people fear death. I'm not saying I want to die tomorrow, but I have a level of comfort to the point where I'm quite comfortable with the idea that if something really bad happened, death is an option. What about your pictures and like your personal stuff that you've created? Online or? Yeah. What, what do you mean? Would people have to deal with it or? Yeah. Like what, how do you store that stuff? Oh, uh, so I have a Dropbox account and I store it all online. Awesome. Uh, oh, as far as like, but I don't have physical pictures or anything like that anymore. So you have no, you're digital everything. Digital for all of that stuff. And I've gotten rid of a lot of the digital stuff because how often do I ever look at any of those pictures? And I want to live in the present. Awesome. Rob, thank you so much for sharing your ideas and doing what you do. Where can people find you? Uh, my website's just robgreenfield.org. And then if you type that name into, uh, so, or type just my name into social media, you'll find me on there as well. Rob Greenfield, is robgreenfield.tv still Yeah, around? .tv, .org, they both go to the same place. Okay, and then where are you going next? Um, I'm in San Diego for a month, then I'll be in Europe for a month, and then Cheryl, my partner, and I are moving to Florida in the winter. Thank you so much for sharing your wild ideas. Thank we you loved for, having you. Yeah, thank you for having me on. You. After this interview, I asked Rob a few more questions. One of the things I wanted to know is how do you deal with distractions? And he had this great app he told me about called Freedom, which literally shuts off his Wi-Fi from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. the next morning and on the weekends, and he really tries to stick to it. I also asked him if he monetized his videos because he gets millions and millions of downloads on some of the videos he creates. They're pretty fascinating. He said he doesn't and he doesn't use YouTube because he doesn't want there to be ads in front of his videos advertising things he doesn't believe in. He's such an interesting guy doing so much good. I'll have links on where to buy his book and find out more about Rob in the show notes on wildideasworthliving.com. Thank you to Newzest and Olukai for supporting this show. If you go to newzest-usa.com, enter the code WILDIDEAS, you'll get 15% off your order. If you go to Olukai and just buy a pair of shoes, you'll be stoked because they look good and you can wear them pretty much anywhere and they're super comfy. If you want to help this show out, we're trying to provide as much great free content as we can, but it does take money. You can either donate to the show or what really helps is writing a review on iTunes. All that takes is two minutes of your time and it's greatly appreciated. I'm trying to get to 100 reviews by the end of this month and right now we're at about 60 something. So I need 40 of you to write a review and I'd be super stoked. Thanks again to Rob for coming out, for sharing your wild ideas and living so wildly. And thanks to you for listening. I really appreciate it. Wherever you are in the world, don't forget, some of the best adventures often happen when you follow your wildest ideas. Next week, we have on Captain Lizzie Clark. Mm -hmm.